It's my absolute honor, in fact, privilege to introduce uh, my co-convener for this event, for the conference, Rebecca M. Brown, who is professor and chair of the Department of History of Art and also chair of the Advanced Academic Program in Museum Studies and Cultural Heritage Management at Johns Hopkins. You have to have an acronym for yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> get on that first job right uh, sorry she has served as a consultant and a curator of modern and contemporary Indian art for the Peabody Essex Museum the Walters Art Museum and the Shelley and Donald Rub Rubin Foundation and has taught across widely across North America and in the UK Rebecca's research engages in the history of art architecture and visual culture of South Asia from the late 18th century to the present she has numerous publications which have engaged with several interlinked themes, the early British presence on the subcontinent, the anti-colonial movement of the 20th century, art of the decades after India's independence in 1947, and the economic and political machi mach machinations of the long 1980s, which of course was a, something that we were both obsessing about a few a couple of decades ago. <laughs> oh, time flies. Her current research focuses on the painter Casey Spanica, uh, and his use of illegible writing on his paintings from the 1960s and 1970s and that's what she's going to speak about today or speak from today but she's also working on the photographic practice of Dianita Singh and Anu Matthew as well as the work of Rina Banerjee. So today's talk is titled Artistic Relations Mapping KCS Panikar's Constellations. Welcome and thank you Rebecca. Thank you so much, Sumati. And uh, Sumati convinced me that I had to give a paper at this conference that I myself was convening. So this is, I blame Sumati for this. But anyway, I'm very happy to be able to share this work with you. This is very much in progress. And so I really welcome your thoughts and contributions. Um, all right. So in Casey Spanaker's home hangs a painting of Mary and Joseph's flight into Egypt, depicting Joseph riding a donkey and holding the Infant Christ, although I'm not sure the donkey's actually very clear there. Um, painted by Jomni Roy in the late 1940s. It shares wall space with Panikar's wife's drawings, Ramabai Panikar, who was an art student at the Madras College of Art with Panikar while he was uh, a student there. And while he did not she did not pursue her career, these early works demonstrate an untapped talent and suggest a second set of keen eyes at work in the Panikar home. On a side table in the front sitting area stands a sculpture of Krishna made by Panikar's son Nandagopal. In a room thousands of miles away in Beverly Hills, um, Panikar's daughter Sumitra Menon has hung her father's paintings next to his sketches of the family, herself as a child, her young mother, his self-portrait, and this is a very dim sketch, I apologize, you can't see it, but it's of their dog. Oh, yeah. uh, the dogs are very important in the Panikar household, so this is a kind of key theme in my archive. Um, the art in the house also includes many of Panikar's contemporaries and students, and some unexpected connections. What you see on the right is a work by Kenneth Noland, the American um, DC-based painter, um, which is a print actually gifted to Nandagopal in the early 1980s, which is hung near the powder room. Uh, Sumitra notes that Nandagopal didn't like the work so much, so he let her keep it. Um, and then in a later moment um, in DC, Nolan's art world, and this is not DC, this is in um, the Panikar house, but I didn't have a picture of me with the two of them in DC. Um, I went to the National Gallery um, with Kalla, um, who is Panikar's um, daughter-in-law, and her daughter, so his granddaughter, Pallavi, whom you see here. Um, hearing stories about their trip to the US and the UK um, in the early 1980s, that is Kala and Nandagopal, when they met not just Noland, but Anthony Caro, the sculptor. And we stop by one of his sculptures in the East Wing's atrium at the National Gallery, and we talk about the colors in Noland's paintings upstairs. So the spatially dispersed collections of works, people, and conversations I've just outlined here are, as many fellow scholars will recognize, just another artifact of the research project process. The archive for artists working in the 20th century includes very intimate encounters with relatives' homes, memories, and paths through the world. In our work as scholars, we reactivate some of these nodes. 
often silently and not so silently, reconfiguring them as we seek out new information, new ways of thinking about the artist, the work, the history, and the infrastructures that enable these connections. So many artists of Punnaker's generation, and here you see him in front of his exhibition in Paris in 1954, I believe, um, particularly those artists from the so-called Global South, traveled with the support of cultural and governmental organizations, the Alliance Francaise, the Goethe Institute, the British Council, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and other Asian, Central, and South American, and Soviet, in this period, institutions. And in that travel, encountered works of art in person, fellow artists, gallerists, and critics, patrons and collectors, um, and art students. And they moved through museums, galleries, department stores. Um, there's a long discussion in the archive about an Oster blender that Punnaker wanted to buy for his wife. So, you know, these are the kinds of things. Um, embassies, train stations, airports, landscapes, and private homes in ways that shaped their work. Or maybe didn't shape their work at all, right? So this is the other thing that I always want to kind of keep in mind. So Alex Segerman um, has offered a productive spatial and temporal metaphor for thinking through these intersections, flows, and relations, mm -hmm. the constellation. In her book fo focused on Egyptian modern art, she lays out the potential of this metaphor, describing a set of stars mapped with lines in between, um, some of the stars, but not others, to form a shape that we kind of project onto the stars. She notes both the specificity of the lines and the differing strength of each star. So some stars shine brighter, some glow softly, and they don't just form a flat pattern, but they actually, if you look at them properly, form a kind of three-dimensional um, spatial network. Some stars aren't included in the constellation, it just zips right by them, the connective lines sort of missing. Others are never seen, with the brightness of a nearby star or our atmospheric light from our own vision too strong to pick them out in the sky. So this variegation and emphasis activates the constellation metaphor as a helpful guide for thinking about artists' interconnections. And I quote uh, Segerman here, because it refers to the precise and finite nature of the artist's connections and also characterizes how these artists visualize these connections in their artworks, unquote. So the mapping of the constellation and artist networks certainly involves physical movement across national borders with funding from those organizations I mentioned, but it isn't limited to geopolitical relations. And it allows for a more fine-grained, textured understanding of the global, so it's not flattening like the global, like Punnaker's a global artist, of course, sure. But what does that mean? How do we get that texture? So um, I take up Segerman's approach against a background of two other thinkers um, here as well, um, who for me enrich and ground her thinking. Edward Glissant's Poetics of Rel Relation, particularly his theorization of errantry, um, so a kind of wandering movement, and I sort of, I feel like there's a comet that comes into the constellation that might interrupt it occasionally and fairly irregularly. Um, so if we think about it that way. And Reiko Tomi, who's a um, Japanese critic and curator um, who published this book you see on the screen, Radicalism in the Wilderness. Um, she, her engagement with um, the term resonance, um, where you have two art worlds that seem to be doing similar things. She has a great essay on hole digging <laughs> in the 1960s, where there's artists in New York, uh, Klaus Oldenburg's digging holes, and there's artists in Japan digging holes, but they're doing it for very, very different reasons. So there's resonance, but how do we understand that? How do we make it productive? Um, but not necessarily actual archivally just demonstrated contact. Um, so as I move through what I'm about to move through, I'll try to signal when those two also enter my thought. But those are the sort that's my um, methodological constellational cluster, if you will, as those sort of three. Okay, so I have three constellations I want to walk through today. One is the Cholamundal cluster. Um, okay, so one would, of course, for KCS Panaker, who is from Chennai, uh, Madras School of Art, and then founded the Cholamundal Artist Village, that that would be one of the major clusters. So I want to start there. Um, 
So they, in 1966, he and other artists and students from the Madras School of Art, where he was at the time principal, um, founded the Cholamandal Artist Village south of Chennai. One off-sided connecting thread among these artists lies in the attentiveness to line and drawing, um, often emphasizing line over color, for example, and this is both from the artist's own mouths but also in the critical discourse. Another, ironically, to a certain extent, or in contrast, is the attentiveness to color in itself, the experimentation with pulsating colors and their jostling on the canvas. Now, in my approach to this group, I actually, there's a thread in the historiography that wants to create the Madras school or the Madras movement. And I'm sort of very resistant to that because I actually think that these artists are incredibly diverse. And much like the progressive artists of Bombay, there's not really a singular, there's certainly not a singular style. And, and I feel like it does them a disservice to kind of lump them together. Because what's happened in the case of the Madras school is that they've been lumped together, put on a shelf and ignored. So I would rather bring them out and talk about them individually, which is part of my larger project. Um, okay, so I'm doing this through these small linkages and connections and trying to map a little bit of a constellation. So let me begin with Nandagopal, um, whose work Centaur from 1969 you see here on the screen. Um, and I think this work is an early work by him. It offers a window into his approach to sculpture. Um, and again, in, it's often characterized both as linear, which you can see a bit, bit here, and as frontal, primarily frontal. And of course, you can see that here, but also this is a pretty three-dimensional sculpture. So um, the, the sort of spade shape on the front is certainly very frontal. He works from models from a range of periods and cultures, including um, Hiro, Sati, and Memorial, and Naga stones, um, and various other relief carvings and different in different contexts across the subcontinent. Um, the... These are all, by the way, these are all in the Madras Museum. So these would have been very familiar to Nandagopal, sort of his, his home collection, as it were. Um, so where was I? So the title Centaur also, of course, signals a link to Mediterranean culture and narrative. And Nandagopal did travel in Europe and America and, of course, knows the literature. And this is sort of in the water that people are breathing at the time. Um, so... While these works, they have a frontality to them, they embrace a sensibility of relief or even collage. Um, they're objects that often, both actually the historical ones, but also Nandagopal's, even his more frontal ones, they have relief on all sides. Like, so you, they'll be put up against the wall, but if you, and I encourage you to do this in a museum, if you peer behind them, then you can sort of see that he's actually decorated them all around. Um, so they might suggest that primary view, but they always have something to offer from the back. So Centaur gives us a couple, in addition to these historical relations, potentially, um, a couple of other relations, the first and most prominent to his father. Now, Nandagopal goes by Nandagopal because he did not want to go by his family name um, so as to distance himself from his father. So in me putting them together, I'm sort of going against, I'm trying to reconnect the magnets in some way that he wanted to turn away. Um, and it's not that he completely rejected the fact that his father was, of course, a major, you know, person in his life and in his artistic formation. But I'm hoping that you can see the connections that I'm drawing here between these two paintings, or the, between the sculpture and the painting. The painting is like, it's undated and unsigned, which means for Panikar that maybe that it was unfinished. It's currently in the NGMA in Bangalore. It's called The World's Second, um, and it includes some Roman script on it up at the top and some equations. This indicates that it's early in his, what is called his Words and Symbols series, which is the last series in his life, which he started in 1963. So I tentatively date this to 1964. It can't really be later than 1964. Um, so, and the centaur is 1969. So there's there's some clear kind of dialogue happening here with the shape of the centaur's sort of torso head, the way in which geometric elements are being used, the linearity of the forms in both cases, I think. And then we can also add another resonance here to use 
Reiko Tomi's word. Um, this on the right is a painting by Paul Clay, currently at the and was then at the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C., where Panecker visited um, in 1963. Um, so I think about a year before, or in the year before he painted the painting on the left. But we don't know if he saw the painting there. I can, I need to go and check the Phillips to see if it was on view. But it doesn't matter because it was published by Panikar and Janaki Ram, mm -hmm. his collaborator, in Art Trends in April mm -hmm. of 1963 in that journal. So you can see it in the top right next to a whole other range of clay paintings that reference his hieroglyphics stage next to Egyptian hieroglyphics with an essay that's excerpted from Will Groman's book on Paul Clay, which was circulating at the time. Right. So these are some of the direct archival collect connections that we can certainly draw here that make it not just resonance. Okay. So, and here's just another, so you can see the painting um, that I see as kind of connected to that Panikar and Nandagopal work, and then the, another example of the Egyptian hieroglyphs that Paul Clay was working with, or his take on Egyptian hieroglyphs. So the spade shape of the head, the sculpted stele from Hindu and Buddhist contexts and the subcontinent beyond, focus on linear articulation of a frontal body, the use of small geometric or textual forms to fill out the composition. These elements dance among the three artists. None, none, in addition to that, see I'm building out the constellation now, Nanda Gotwal's teachers and Panakar's colleagues, P.V. Janakiram and Danapal, so Danapal on the left, far left, Janakiram in the middle, um, join this constellation uh, in that Janakiram's focus on manipulating sheet metal and his attention to Christological imagery resonate with these iconic forms in both metal and paint. Tanapal worked in various media, including paint, um, but then he adds his kind of textural attentiveness to wood and stone in the rough surfaces of a lot of his different sculptures. Um, and that is also evoked in both Nandagopal and Clay's and Panikar's works as well, that kind of textural surface um, roughness. So, and then we have, we can bring Jamini Roy back in, um, who was definitely in the sort of circulation with Nandagopal and Panikar because he's, in, he's hanging in their house. Um, and then he's also published in our trends. This, this particular painting gets published in our trends multiple times and in other publications. So this kind of, again, this, this is like a constantly moving cluster, right? Um, so how does the figure operate in these artists' works? Here's my final constellation for this. <laughs> Um, the question presses forward as we build the constellation out from Nandagopal and his father. Shivaji Panikar, no relation, I believe, in writing on the Madras movement and its sculpture, notes that both Dhanapal and Panikar were experimenting with the figure by shifting it into a mode that Shivaji calls a Jamani Roy-like figuration that establishes a, quote, modernist mode of quasi-abstraction. And I like that quasi-abstraction phrase that he attributes to Donapal in the late 1950s, while noting that Panikar is doing the same thing in the painting, in his paintings at the same time. So Nandagopal then sits in relation to other sculptors, but also Roy, Panikar, in working through questions of the quasi-abstracted figural, which I think is a kind of capacious understanding of both the figural and frontality, and a sense of surface marking that transcends medium and creates a constellation that develops aesthetic resonances into a forceful argument for a 20th century modernist idiom anchored in the figure. Um, the guiding star of this constellation, that question of figuration, organizes the relation, but as Tomi's resonance reminds us, each answer is somewhat distinct from the other. So I'm not saying they're all doing the same thing, I'm saying this is a constellation that's very interesting. They're talking to one another, but jostling. All right. So, second constellation. Color, hot, indic, and otherwise. So, another constellation um, that I signaled at the beginning is color. And we have 
Annapurna's wonderful um, talk this morning about color. So this is wonderful. Um, I feel a lot of kinship with with your um, with your paper. Um, so this also starts at Cholamandal with um, P. Gopinath uh, or Gopinath, as you see here, who is a painter of a little younger than Nandagopal, or sorry, a little younger than younger than Panikkar and around Nandagopal's generation who graduated from the Madras School of Arts and Crafts in 1970 and was a founding member, even before he graduated, a founding member of Cholamandal. So this work is um, begun in 1977 and finished in 2008. He told me, um, I was like, because it's in the museum, it, it actually has a dash, 97 to 2008. And I was like, it took you that long to finish the painting. It's acrylic. It dries really fast. How is this possible? And he said, oh yeah, he had it stashed. It was unfinished. He had it stashed in his studio and then the Madras museum was about to open and they needed a big painting. So, <laughs> so he pulled it out and finished it in 2008 and put it on the wall. So this is, so it's, I put a comma or an and, 1997 and 2008. Um, anyway, it's in the Cholamandal Museum, so you can go see it next time you're in Chennai. Um, this is his dynamic approach to color and form. Using zones of red and deep yellow orange alongside layers of cream and areas of deep, deep black, which have a little shine to them. He limits his colors, but uses their strength to anchor the work. Alongside the repetition of the curve of the bird's head, echoed in several curly cues and forms that resemble the Arabic numeral two, mm -hmm. he produces a rhythm of shape and line across the canvas that works as much through color as it does through delineation. And it's almost more about, for me, it's more about the color than the line, which speaks against the normal narrative of the Madras school. Um, a detail of the work here on the left, so I got the work on the right, and this is a detail, um, allows us to see the texture of the paint's various surfaces from the rough passage at the front of the bird's neck to the bumpy and shiny texture of the deep black and translucency of both the cream and red layers. Putting this work in relation to one of Panikker's experiments with a similar palette, reds and greens, words and symbols, all of his Words and symbols are also titled words and symbols. Um, this is 1971 on the left. Highlights the distinct approaches each takes to experimentation with color. While Panikkar worked in a range of palettes across his career from ochre browns to soft pastels, reds and greens represents a bit of a rare work where he's actually delving into deep, bright primary colors. And you can actually, it's like, it's primary colors and then what it's like that children the children's song whichever one you learned where you know red and whatever it is red red and blue make purple right like this kind of thing so he's sort of experimenting with those basic formulations elsewhere i've argued that the work reads like an experiment or a lesson in color with juxtapositions of blue text on a red ground creating visual discomfort and you can see that in the top left corner and the glow of the yellow circle at the top signaling by contrast by its contrast, the admixtures of color in the zones around it, the impurities, if you will. Um, Panikkar's lines, unlike Gopinath's, float on top, right, of these experiments, in relation to them, to be sure, but they float on top. Gopinath using, uses color as shape, as much as he also occasionally draws over and across color. Mm -hmm. And then there's the distinction in medium as well. Um, acrylic, which is what Gopinath works with, um, usually gets you a bit of a brighter tone. You can make it duller or you know more nuanced, but um, oil is actually quite difficult to get this kind of bright brassiness that um, Panikkar has in his oil painting on the left. Um, and Gopinath pushes acrylic beyond what it's normally supposed to do by giving it a little bit of opportunity to do layering. And to do that, he has to work very quickly with the acrylic. So they both built different artistic languages around color um, and around layered paint and around the dynamic relation between color and line. And so I see this as a kind of language of painting in the spirit of a, a Bauhaus um, oriented quest for a language of color line painting form. Um, and so this is another constellational note again, and you see I'm going back to Clay. Um, his zones of color and rhythmic experimentations with color and with letter forms. So here we've got rectangular patches of color in his static dynamic gradation of 1923. Um, and particular for me are the bright two white squares that kind of pop out at you that seem to 
push and pull the space of the painting in a way that I see both Gopinath and Panikkar experimenting with in very different ways in their work. Um, all right. Um, so jostling of adjacent color, right? And then in works where clay adds typeface, or this isn't actually printed, this is painting, but it's sort of emulating typeface, and he does this quite often. Um, this is centrifugal memorial page, also of the same year, 1923. They draw the eye as they do in Gopinath's work. Um, but here they're participating in that rhythm of the rectangular color shapes um, arranged in, you can sort of see the title, a centrifugal spiral of color in the clay. Now, that the central pair of letters reads egg in German, um, adds another shape and metaphor to the composition, again, drawing a constellational link forward to Gopinath, whose 20 or 2-0 form, it's not really um, in his painting, um, not only reads as numbers, but includes the ova of the zero, itself then echoed in yellow at the top right and drawn in outline at the bottom left. So we have this kind of resonance here. I think elemental forms is what we're talking about, right? Um, so neither Panikkar nor Gopinath succumb to what has been called um, an Indic palette in these works. Although one could certainly riff on mango, saffron, kumkum, sandalwood um, descriptors for these. Um, and this is definitely a choice I try to resist. Um, because I think that in the aggregate, you know, neither Panikkar nor Gopinath here, um, they don't signal these connections directly. I mean, some artists in South Asia definitely own and claim a certain relation to um, historical uh, threads of color palette, but um, that's not something that I see either of them doing distinctly, although they will both talk about Kerala, right? Um, so that's a different conversation. We can talk about that. And I think that for me, the truth of the world is that one can find in India and Europe and America all of the different colors, <laughs> right? And so I feel like um, that's something we need to keep an eye on and that color has always been a site of exoticizing descriptors, the way that people, color is so difficult to talk about that the way that we talk about it is we add metaphor to it and often the metaphor is orientalist, almost like I would say 80% of the time the metaphor is orientalist. Okay, so we just have to, you know, sort of be aware of that. But I do think that in some of their paintings, these artists are actively working against the collapsing into an Indic palette, like sort of trying not, trying to resist that in their experimentations. And that is very, very interesting to me. So I keep an eye on that a little bit and I try to ask them about it if they are still with us and see what they say. Um, Gopi Nath said, no, that's not what I'm doing. So, <laughs> but that doesn't matter. This is what I think he's doing. Okay, so the Gopinath Panikkar clay constellation then forms a node within a larger framework of artists using color to find anchor in a national frame or resisting that same demand. It also works outward to artists such as Velu Vishwanathan, who's another Cholamandal painter who I have here at the top right, um, uh, who, whose large-scale paintings of deep red in Cassin, uh, almost to the point of purple, um, offer a kind of um, very different manner. They pulsate in a very different manner than Panikkar or Gopinath, forming what I described to myself, at least as a distinctive kind of bass note drone that underlies his mature style. Um, so as I was saying, a lot of these painters, all three of these painters have Carolyn roots and they refer to those often in their conversations. Um, and Clay sort of shifts his, pal his palette a little bit more to pastels after he visits Morocco. Um, but we would never talk about Clay's painting as like Swiss German palette, like that would never happen. So this is again why I'm sort of thinking about color in ways that resist that narrative. Um, so all of these artists for me are investigating, pushing the problem of color as a part of an artistic language. And that to me is what's important and what their answers are is what's important um, in, 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 and how those answers are informed certainly by their historical and political context is part of that, but it's not the only piece of it. All right, final constellation, clay and language. 
So many clay works, including Centrifugal Memorial Page, which we've seen, utilize letters painted in an approximation of typeface and distributed in an isolated way, such that their status as symbol is emphasized over their potential for meaning. So the letters often, so they will sometimes refer to a particular, like you can pick out initials of his friends and things like this, but basically they're sort of, they sit there as abstract forms almost. Um, he also, Clay, experiments with text as pseudotext, scribbling writing-like gestures on paper, as here on the left in Abstract Writing of 1931, and he did a series of exp paintings that explore the alphabet. Um, he experiments with forms akin to Egyptian hieroglyphs, produces semi-readable text, um, taking poems here, um, and this is actually readable, it's just very difficult to parse. Um, and placing letters into a grid-like structure, varying the background such that you struggle to read the text. He plays with symbols from musical notations to forms idiosyncratic to his own visual language. Um, and in seeking out these options for a language in and of painting, his wide-ranging experimental work has inspired many artists, not just the ones that I'm talking about today, who can draw sustenance from his many works and writings while also pushing against his overwhelming historical presence. Panneker actually calls him his guru and realizes that he can't copy clay but must start from the beginning on his own in order to forge a path. And I actually wonder if that painting I showed you earlier, the, night, the one undated one, if that's this moment where he's like grappling with clay and then it's like, I can't do it, I've got to do my own thing, right? And pulls back from that because it's a fairly unusual work. Um, Gopinath also works in forms including pseudoscript and typeface that gesture to a relation to clay. Um, all three of them talk, use birds in their work pretty extensively. Um, and so there's this kind of, I, what I want to do with them at this third constellation is think about the multiplicity of relations to clay. And clay is so variegated that it's actually really interesting in here in terms of text, pseudotext, language, letters, symbols. So centering clay here or perhaps allowing him to be a bright star within the constellation, skates at the edge of what artists, critics, and art historians have long tried to avoid in writing and thinking about artists outside of the Northern Atlantic canon. Rather than see this relation as one of derivation, with Clay as the genius first artist and all others as mere echoes or latecomers to the particular brand of modernism Clay represents, I want to follow Tomi's understanding of both connection, the direct archival connection, and resonance. Panneker and others certainly knew of Clay's works. They read his writing. They saw it in person in trips to Europe, America, and in reproduction. Their connection to Clay can be demonstrated easily. The resonance actually interested me more. How does Clay, in quotes, or what I'm starting to call Clay spirit, <laughs> um, inflect these artists' works. What do they do with their connectivity to the artist, and how does their work, as Panneker notes, begin anew, but with clay in mind? So I want to see the potential, following Tomi, for a productive rather than dismissive exploration of the relation that seeks a horizontal mode of resonance, while acknowledging that, of course, there is a canonicity of clay as a figure within 20th century art histories. So when I do this in a context of Western art historians, I don't have to explain who clay is. I mean, I don't have to explain them to you either, but there's a kind of, like they, they instantly get a little bit more comfortable. It's actually quite, it's quite nice to see. <sighs> okay, she's talking about someone I know. Um, okay, so also I feel like the resonance might go the other way, right? How does our understanding of Gopinath's painting help us to think about Clay's experimentation with color, right? So I am also thinking about resonance just doesn't have to be that historical direction, so. Madhvi Parekh is the artist I want to talk about here, and her formation as an artist is grounded in part in a deep engagement in Clay's pedagogical sketchbook in particular, because she actually worked through its lessons as part of her initial um, training under the guidance of her husband, Manu Parekh. Um, and so unlike other painters who strive to distance themselves from clay, which is absolutely understandable given the discourse around this, Parekh developed her own language with a very much an openness to what clay had to offer rather than a need to resist his writing as coming from the outside. So, um, so for me, I've taken to listening to moments when, when artists like Parekh 
actually sort of get excited about Clay or like want to talk to me about Clay because th because then I know, oh, you've actually looked at him. Like it's not just this figure you've dismissed. It's like you've actually, like me, kind of dug into what is this Clay person doing? Um, so then we have really great conversations. Um, so let me, these are just two examples that I think may resonate with other works I've shown you of Clay's uh, or that you may know of Clay's. But let me put up this comparison here, which is, Parekh's Kaliya Daman of 1993 on the right, um, which is a very large work in dialogue with another large work. Um, sorry, the screen is so, I want to bring you all closer. Okay. Um, this is Panikar's Words and Symbols of 1970. Um, and they clearly share a number of reference points. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a snake form here mm -hmm. in the Panikar, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this vertical element that he also uses not quite figural, sort of semi-figural in both cases. Um, so there's some compositional elements, but also the use of um, small uh, repetitive patterns and symbols and writing and this kind of thing, populating the body of the, of the snake, um, the serpent, and, um, in Parikh's work. Each has taken different clues from clay, from geometry, from various vernacular um, source material and created a new language on their own. So Parikh, thank you, um, might be looking here to Alpana designs in the Oliver patterning, or she might be looking to some of Clay's musical works here, um, or some of his works where he's got this really dense color and patterning across the surface. Um, this is some of his later works. Um, but both experiment with a kind of language of symbols, of repeated figures that pop up again and again. Um, and here I'm showing a detail of Punnaker's work and a detail of Pereik's work to give you a closer view. And Punnaker and, and Pereik also work with these kinds of zones of color across their paintings that change and the kind of in the background underneath all of these symbols um, that I think ground the painting in very different ways and give us different... Um, layering of, of the levels of the painting. So I haven't had a chance to ask Parekh if she's like studied or really gotten into Panikar's work. I sort of assume she's at least seen it, but that doesn't necessarily mean any communion with the, with the body of work has happened for her. And the resonance, as Tomi notes, doesn't rely on that contact. Um, so in the end, I feel like just as clay is not one thing, these resonances also can shift and morph. Um, as they interact with one another, whether it's Panikar, Parikh, Parikh, Panikar, Clay, um, these kinds of things. So let me get my, here's my final constellational slide for them. So I just want to end by pushing this constellation metaphor one notch further, which is a little terrifying for me. This is sort of the speculative art history, so feel free to knock me back down if you're not buying this. But I want to talk about stars, and I want to talk about astrology. So in one of Honecker's paintings, he includes an explicit reference not only to horoscopes, but we think, actually this is thanks to Rich, we think to his own birth horoscope, um, which you can see the grid up at the top center, and we think that's a, his own birth horoscope. He often refers to celestial bodies, charts and symbols that engage with the South Indian and specifically Carolyn practice of, practices of astrology. And so for me, the constellation metaphor, which Segerman takes on in a very different context, certainly Egypt has its own astrologies, but here she doesn't go to the astrology space. Um, <laughs> but here it's so central, I feel like, to the cultures that I'm dealing with and to Panikar in particular, that I think this actually is important. Um, if the constellations I've mapped above probe resonances within Panikar's work, from direct kinship, literally his son, to distant temporal successors, from spirits of canonical artists like clay to vernacular artists drawing patterns in sandalwood and paste. This approach demands that we acknowledge the ways in which our own presence as scholars, as art historians also forms a node in this constellation. And as such, this too involves a difficult balance of speculation and reliance on fact. How far can we push that connection we found in the archive? How much should we rely on the one conversation we had with that artist? How do we deal with the works themselves as major pieces of data for analysis? One might call this scholarly astrology. Um, Mercury or Mars might be rising. The moon is pulling the tides. And these things 
almost certainly have an effect on all of our lives. I truly believe that. <laughs> um, there is truth to an astrological way of knowing about the world. And also much speculation, much hedging, much, much guessing. And so to me, the constellational approach via a poetics of errant relation and echoes of resonance um, allows us to recognize the astrological in our humanistic science. Our own reading of the stars shapes how the stars are seen what constellations come to the fore. And so we continue to listen for the resonance, note the errant comment, find the weak and strong links that allow us to speak. As Punnicker and his constellation sought a language of art through line, color, and scribbles, so we seek a language of scholarship through the resonances of constellations or our astrology. So, thank you. <laughs> Marvelous. Sorry. Marvelous. Oh, wonderful. Uh, last, we only have 15 minutes, but the conversation is yes, continuing over please. today and tomorrow, so yes, yes please, Anapurna, Anapurna. <laughs> So, um, I wrote it, I, I did a lot of work on my design. Oh great, yes, perfect. I'm just starting in on her, yeah. so yeah. So, one of the, I think maybe over a period of seven, eight years I've been interviewing her very like, uh, I wrote two essays about her. Yeah. And what I and also about her also did a show for Manu Bhatti called Husband. Ah, uh, right. And then there was Abdul Padansi, uh -huh. who I worked with very early on yeah. in my, my career. Uh, so I think clay should be, and I've not done enough work on this. I'm just putting it sure. to you. Um, he's up to Atul Dodia. Mm. He also talked about mm -hmm. clay. Mm -hmm. That clay was a person that. That in, at least in Bombay at JJ School, mm. uh, when Abdul was a student and he did, he wanted to do something else besides the, the sort of naturalistic classical yeah. you know, copying of, of plaster casts that happened over there, um, they had an alternative school outside of right. the classes for themselves. Yeah. Where Clay was um, their, as you say, guru. But more than Guru, I think they saw him as a co-traveler. Yeah, and, right. And yeah. Uh, I think that he, uh, I don't know about Abbas, but I know from Madhaviji and Manuda, and Manuda mm -hmm. also came to play in somewhat mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. So when they got married, um, she was maybe 16. Yeah, right. And then I think at some point she articulated in those years, to 18, she articulated she or two wanted to be a painter. Mm -hmm. So, how do you bring somebody to painting? And for him, clay was very useful mm -hmm. uh, and important mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. he makes it okay not to be perfect, right? Yeah, and not to, uh, to master uh, to get to be comfortable with things that are easily where knowledge from an Indic world of Rangolis and Manda and yeah. Pitora painting and those kinds of things. Yeah. can move into more modernist things, and modernist things can move into yeah. this world. Mm. And without the emphasis on perfection. Right. No, I agree. I think, and it's interesting because I think it's just, maybe you feel this too, but it's sort of in the last eight, nine years. Um, like nine, year, nine, ten years ago, I don't think I could have given this paper without people yelling at me. Um, but but I, I do think there's a kind of embrace now of like, no, no. This isn't about derivation. This isn't about. This is about a really important thinker, and fellow traveler, and that's exactly how I see him as well. That and it's and it's not so much Clay of 1923 who's traveling with them. It's Clay of, you know, 1965 in India as it's being received and circulated and talked about. Right. So it's a. That's why I sort of Clay spirit is what I'm sort of going with. Um, and then what is the Clay that they're looking at? This is the other question I'm trying to get at. And actually, Punnicker and Janakiram's publication has really helped with that, right? Because they they did Art Trends, which has tons of issues, and then they also did the um, Indian art of the, since the 1940s, which has a bunch of quotes in it, including about clay and by clay. So I think there's a really interesting, it's it's helpful to be able to trace that dynamic. The, the reception and engagement of clay comes in waves. Yeah. So yeah, so of course there's the 22 Bauhaus show where his yeah. works are actually there. But then this is, yeah. I think it was 30s and 40s for Yeah, okay. And uh, then later it was Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. When I think, for me, the way I'm reading that is not necessarily, again, a direct connection, but that so many of the people who were there went on to teach, you know, in the next generation. And so there's this kind of, yeah, there's this trickle, trickling out or resonance. I love, I love that sort of echo metaphor. Um, and I do think that's partly where we get a connection. And, and then some of it is just, is new infusion, right? So newly, people newly discovering clay later on. Um, so nothing to do with the Bengal exhibition. But I do think, and then there are other exhibitions of clay in India. Unfortunately, they all post-date uh, Panikkar's death in 1977. But th he does circulate. So they can see him, see works in person. Um, I loved what you've done here and you know, given a lot to think with conceptually and not just for this, not just for art, right? So very mm. importantly for images, but also for those like me who don't work. I mean, who work in other disciplines as well. So thank you for that. But I'm, you know, I can't believe I'm asking this question, but I may as well ask it, right? There's, there's a market. There's mm. an art market. Mm. There's yep. competition. Yep. I mean, these artists are also, you know, competing for... Yeah. Eyeballs, but also you know, yeah. money and all of that. How would you place? It, it seems yeah. too happy. Right. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you know, yeah, using yeah. the astrology metaphor, we're saying no auspiciousness. Right. Where's, Where's the? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's fair. Right. I mean, um, That's conflict, fair. and you know, the few artists I've talked to, sometimes if I suggest anything, like oh, I'm so careful. Yeah. No, I'm not like them at all. I'm doing something totally different. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we want to think about that mm. with, you know, mm. these theoretical constructs. Yeah, no, I think there's definitely, because it's not just money and the market, it's also, you know, um, it's not like the 1960s, we're all happy and joyful. Yeah, I mean, I think that there, I think I need to address, oh, there it goes, I need to address that critical edge of both the politics and the, oh, the competition. I mean, I think one of the things about one of the things that's sort of allowing me to separate from that a little bit with Panikkar is the Cholamandal artist village. Mm -hmm. And again, not that that was some utopian space. They were yelling at each other and there was mm -hmm. conflict. But I do think there was a underlying ethos of mutual collaborative support to a certain extent. Um, one of the artists talked about it as a gateless gate so there's a sort of, there's like a, a safe space, um, and then you can sort of do whatever you want. You can go out of the gate if you want, you can come back in, you know, this kind of thing. Um, so there were definitely fights and anger and, and disagreement and over financial things as well, not just market things, but like mm -hmm. land ownership and stuff like this. But I think that there's also um, the thread or the seed that, that Panikkar and others who were founders planted was a kind of the world is a really hard place for an artist. Let us gather together in order to fight that rather than fight one another. Um, and so, yeah, so I do feel that that competition element. Um, Guy Patel says in one essay, it's like, it's really freeing to not be wanted in the market. You can do whatever you want when you're mm -hmm. flying under the radar, right? When no one wants your work. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of, I mean, he said it with the same tone that I just said it in, right? Mm -hmm. But I think there's a sense in which... Um, they weren't selling a lot of work from Chola Mandel, so yeah. um, they weren't making a lot of money on their work. They weren't competing on, there was no market to compete in, and so they weren't really competing on that market. Yeah. And yes, some of them went to France, like Vilo goes to France, and some of them get out and find recognition. And Panikker was a major administrator and had recognition to a certain extent through that, but also had to butt up against the ceiling of the North Indian elites, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, there is a kind of, there's always a tension there, but I do think there's a kind of, um, I see Cholamandal as this potential space of just a tiny bit of separation from that. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, yeah, you're right. But I do need to get the inauspicious back in here. So okay. I hear that, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So, uh, thank you for this. Uh, the way you put it all together, the concept of the constellation, mm. it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, I was just, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was just thinking of the words and symbols. Does it have anything to do with the neo-tantric mm. uh, works of like 
the earlier works of J. Swaminathan, mm-hmm. when he does the geometrical mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of similar. Yeah, um, so, yeah. And maybe like, uh, you know, maybe Vivian Day and mm. Santosh, Santosh. Yep. and Raza, but like, yeah. that is, yeah. I think maybe a separate cluster, but like, a separate constellation, as it were. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. No, it's, I mean another constellation here, and this also speaks to the market, is the Neo Tantra constellation, which I would actually call an inauspicious one, <laughs> or having inauspicious aspects to it. Um, yeah, I think Panikar has been concluded in the Neo Tantric group by um, El Pisihare in particular, who curated a show in Germany in '78 that then traveled in the Festival of India's in both Britain, wait, no, it just went to the States um, in 85, 86. And so that actually congealed something that was happening quite a lot in the, a little bit later period, right? So in the 70s, 80s, when dealers wanted to create a thing that they could sell to the world. And Neo Tantra was somewhat easy pickings in the sense that it was recognizably Indian and also abstract. So you could have both at, both of, at the same time. Um, and I've written about this before, and I think there's something really interesting conceptually there, but I also think there's something really empty conceptually there, right? Um, yeah. The other factor here is honestly the, the literature and the canonization of um, particularly a, a particular segment of North Indian, Baroda-based, but also Delhi and... Bombay, um, modern Indian art um, around figuration and a particular kind of figuration and narration that was sort of championed by Gita Kapoor for very good reasons against the primacy of a Greenbergian abstraction coming from the U.S. and its descendants. And Gita's like so steeped in that discourse of the Western abstraction and so she, she was really able to mount an excellent sort of defense in some ways, or presentation of, you know, people like Bhupan Kakkar and others who are not in this, working in this idiom. But what happens as a result is that the quasi-abstraction that Panikar wants to talk about kind of just gets ignored. So it either gets ignored or it gets lumped in with the Neo-Tantra. So then it gets... Yes, I'm trying to be very polite, but yes. Um, so, yes, exactly. Not worth talking about, right. And so, and I think that, and it's interesting because she does talk about abstraction. She talks about Nasrin Mohammadi at length, right? But she's, but there's this central discourse, there's this polemic that she has that I think she needs to have in some ways to assert India's, and in, in national Indian art history against the world. Um, and so she does that. She does it very effectively. But someone like Punnaker, who I think is, an abs- as you know, I just spent, you know, a brilliant painter, um, and several others in that, in that group get kind of thrown out with the bathwater because of that. Um, and so, and this is something I've been thinking about a lot, and I want to write something about to like lay it all out for myself almost. But, um, but I think there's, this is, you're absolutely right to see connections between the symbologies that they're using and symbologies that a neo-tantric artist would also use. Swaminathan is right there. Santosh, he's communic- He's corresponding with Santosh in the archive. I have letters between the two of them. So like, yes, it's there. But even in those letters, Santosh is like, I know you hate the neo-tantric thing, but this guy's organizing as an exhibition. I kind of said, yes, I hate the title. What can I do? You know, it's like this. And he's like, what do you think? Can you send a couple of pieces? You know, it's like this kind of, I mean, I I don't know. I'm projecting onto Santosh. I never met him, unfortunately. But, you know, this is kind of the tone of the letter, right? So this kind of thing is happening. um, And that's, I think, really the discourse that, um, and he's he's in a Lalit Kala contemporary issue on Neo-Tantra, Panikar is. So they use it as publicity, as circulation, but then they also want to undermine it. So yeah, we can talk more. I'm I talking to say that Tantra in the Kerala context would be quite different from Tantra in Bengal. Yeah. You know, the word is the same, and you know, I'm really piggybacking onto my husband, yeah. Rich's work, you yeah. know, but yeah. this is, you know, the right. same word is used, but they're quite yeah. different context. Well, and I think there's like magic going on here too. Like it's not just, yeah. it's not just a particular yeah. Tantra. And then, of course, you know, Santosh is looking to Himalayan yeah. Um, material not being got, like yeah. he's so there's a whole and there's there is I mean in some ways we also need to take the neo tantric 
moves seriously, more seriously than we have, because those artists really did study some of those texts and some of those, the yantras and the question of sound and music. And so I think there's something going on there that again got dismissed, kind of like the clay connection got dismissed too quickly. It's like, no, no, we can't talk about that because that leads to a, the wrong place or we don't want to talk about those artists. So, yeah. I, I just have a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's interesting how you fanned out Madhvi Palik into the folk and with analogy with the folk theme. Yeah. And so, it's just, um, I think Sandini Kodar speaks about clean context to the retrospective. Gaitonda, yeah. Gaitonda. yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, Gaitonda is totally non-representative. So I was just yeah. wondering how does that fan, how does he fan out mm -hmm. with uh, Panikar because he's using the symbols and it's, yeah. it's representational in a way. Yeah, so is Clay. Yeah, so is Clay. Yeah, Clay's work is very, it has like those sort of symbols represented. Clay is almost never fully abstract. And it's interesting, I was, part of the reason for that is that in the Nazi era, if he was completely abstract, he would have been put into the degenerates so he keeps the he keeps the text in his work because he's interested in it but i think he keeps it in there also because it means he doesn't fall into the category of abstraction fully but i would also say that yes gaitonda gaitonda's early work is actually has a lot of script in it <laughs> so his later work is very does abstract out but it's there is a period in his like pre mid 60s work that's very um and he so gaitonda would be in here um, Sai Twombly would be, like, I, there's other people that I did not, I already went over time, so I did not have time to put everybody in the constellation I would be putting in here. That's for the book. It's like expanding universe. That's right, it is. It's, that's how, that's why this constellation metaphor is just not going to work, right? <laughs> well, on that note, alas, okay. we have to call the session to a close, but not without a round of applause. Thank you very so, much.